How are you getting on? Uh, quite, quite looking forward to getting back to the cataloging desk uh, and seeing real works instead of just photographs. I quite like the theme of this episode because, as you know, this is, um, I think we're up to number five in the series. And so far, we've been pretty much exclusively talking about paintings, often paintings that I know very well or that the other specialist has chosen. But this time, this is your suggestion to do cabinets of curiosity. The term cabinets can be a bit misleading. It's not always a cabinet that is box sized. The, the original term was more a, a cabinet room. Actually a room. So it seems completely appropriate for our time now. We're all stuck inside in our rooms, forced to kind of live with and look at the same things every single day and try and find some diversions. But um, should we just explain what this concept is? What, what is, what historically was a cabinet of curiosities? So it forms in the Renaissance and early modern period in European history. And in a sense, it's a way of trying to organise the world and understand it works of art as well as natural objects were all put together and the beginnings of a systematic order were imposed upon them. The German terms are often Wunderkammer and Kunstkammer as well. Uh, so you so which, which mean, how do they translate? What do they literally mean? Uh, cabinet of Wonders and uh, Cabinet of Arts. Um, so I sort uh, of have, in my head, I've got this idea that um, in a sense, the whole, if you, if you go back to the 18th century and think about the emergence of the museum, the so-called encyclopedic museum, a place like, say, the British Museum, that's when it was born, it feels to me like they maybe have emerged out of this idea of the cabinet of curiosities where people would collect things from all over the world and show all of these different disciplines and branches of human knowledge and endeavour and place them in a single room or perhaps a single cabinet. You're absolutely right that it's the, the birth of the museum comes from it. If you look at Elias Ashmole's famous cabinet of curiosities, that becomes what we now know as the Ashmolean Museum, one, one of the greatest art museums in the world. I once interviewed the daughter of Henry Moore um, at his home and they preserved the sitting room as he had it. And behind the big, one of the big armchairs was this, what looked like a brilliant sculpture, but I think it's a narwhal tusk. Um, which yeah. was sort of positioned vertically, which I know that people used to believe were unicorn horns. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, to the medieval mind, the unicorn was a very real animal. And when people were exploring the world in the 16th centuries and they brought back from the Arctic these extraordinary tusks, uh, the, the natural assumption was that these were unicorn horns. So, because it's tempting to think of, you know, the idea of a cabinet suggests something which is... Um, perhaps secluded, private, it's not in a public area of the home for guests, but maybe that wasn't the case. You, were these actually about, you would invite people in and sort of, they were a way of showing off, demonstrating your learning, perhaps also your, your wealth, your, your power, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And during the Republic of Letters, you would be able to present yourself on the doorstep of someone who had one of these cabinets. And if they, uh, checked your credentials and would accept you in, you'd then be able to go and examine some of the curiosities and works for yourself. So I, I guess for this, you've been rifling around in your imaginary cabinet of curiosities and picked a few choice highlights if you were able to collect the ultimate one. What, 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 have, you, <laughs> what have you got for us? Uh, I'd, I'd have to start with this meteorite. And it's interesting that you mentioned Henry Moore earlier. Uh, we, we know he loved to collect rocks and certainly flints from the North Norfolk coast that had you know, the shape of his sculptures, those holes. Uh, I'd love to have seen his reaction to this meteorite. To, to me, it's one of the most evocative meteorites that I've handled at Christie's. Uh, not only is it an object that originates from outer space, but this is just a beautiful sculptural object in its own right. How, how does something like this sort of even get discovered? And how, how can we be sure that it isn't just a lump of iron from, from planet Earth? They have a very distinctive chemical signature. And if you were to cut one end of it off and polish it and etch it, you'd see a diagnostic Widmannstaaten pattern, which is this beautiful networky lace of crystals that have cooled very slowly in the vacuum of space. And it's a crystalline pattern that's impossible to recreate on the surface of the Earth. 
And how common are things like this? If you're into collecting things from outer space, how frequently would you be able to find a, a meteorite lump like this? Something like this comes up extraordinarily rarely. Uh, we, we really see in our auctions the very best that the meteorite market has to offer. But as one might expect, meteorites are incredibly rare objects. If, if you look at them as a commodity, the total known mass of all meteorites on Earth is less than Earth's annual gold output. And if you think about how much preciousness and value we apply to gold, uh, we're producing that much every year compared to the, the entirety of known meteorites. And what about the sort of slightly arbitrary quirk that in this case, it does have this lovely, I don't know how big it is. Is it, is it could that fit in your fist? Is it sort of- Oh, it's, 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 it's sizable, not quite two foot long, but it, it weighed a, a huge amount because it's mostly iron. So if that fell off the table onto your foot, you'd certainly uh, be going to hospital. But the fact that it's got this, as you say, this sort of like punctured form, so you have the mass and then there's that hole in the middle, which I guess is just completely random that that's how it has ended yep. up and landed on Earth. But does that sort of add value to it in a sense? Because it's, to a human eye, it's immediately, it's quite desirable. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it just is a beautiful object. And it's very unlikely to find one with a hole like that. It represents the entire history of that object as it fell to Earth through space and was heated and broke up. It then represents its history on Earth as it ultimately would have been eroded away and turned to dust. Had this been discovered a few decades later, that hole probably would have weathered through and you'd have two rather ordinary looking iron meteorites. Well, and as you say, I mean, Henry Moore would have snapped it up for sure. So yeah. um, what else, what, 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 what are some of the other things that you've picked? Uh, I think if you look at any of the famous 16th and 17th century paintings of a Kunstkammer, the scientific instrument you will always see is the armillary sphere. And to me, it's just a, a beautiful, wondrous object. Even if you have no idea about what it represents, it's something with those rings that draws you in. You, you want to learn more of it. So an armillary sphere is an instrument, it is a, it is a working scientific instrument, or historically was, that allowed people to track movements of um, planetary bodies up in the, in the skies, in, in the universe. Yeah, and ultimately it's a 3D map of the skies. And what, what, what I find quite interesting about them is, even after Copernicus publishes his seminal book of astronomy that you know, takes the Earth away from the center of the universe. The armillary sphere carries on a, a strong tradition because it's such a good teaching tool, but it depends entirely upon the ancient way of thinking that the Earth was at the, the center of the solar system. I like the fact that as well, there's clearly, I'm guessing from what you've said, a sort of fashion amongst the people who would have a cabinet of curiosities. There were certain objects that it was de rigueur to have, you know, no one, you wouldn't be seen dead without an armillary sphere if you were a, a true kind of connoisseur, uh, someone who had a cabinet of curiosities. Is that the case that people would vie to collect things and certain things come up again and again? Yeah, certainly. And if, if you look at illustrations of the, the early cabinets, the, the narwhal tusk is an ever present. There's normally some form of taxidermy hanging from the ceiling. Why they're always hanging from the ceiling as opposed to uh, organised elsewhere is a uh, probably down to reasons of theatre. Uh, you would ha certainly have fossils, minerals, and as, as much of the natural world as you could find. I mean, as, as you're saying that, I'm looking here, I've got on my screen, I think this is an image that you suggested, which is, uh, I guess, a, a print of, of a room with, as you say, animals, starfish, is it a, a massive crocodile, which is uh, sort of upside down on the yeah. ceiling. What, what, I mean, it looks amazing in terms of that sort of just spectacle. What, what is this particular cabinet of curiosities? So this, this one belonged to Elias Worm, and it was in the book that he published on his main opus, published after his death in about the 1650s. And who, who was uh, he? Today we'd probably call him a scientist, but the term didn't exist back then. Uh, he, he'd have referred to himself as a natural philosopher, probably. Danish? Yeah, and it's just a beautiful image, isn't it? I, I suspect it's drawn from the life or 
at least an ideal representation of what the cabinet would have looked like in life. And it's just chock-a-block full of natural curiosities and artefacts from recently encountered people from, say, North America and as the European explorers ventured further. So we've talked about, well, this and two objects. Is there, there was another one, wasn't there? I think there was a hand axe that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, it's, it, it's one of a small group of objects found in the UK uh, that date back to hundreds of thousands of years ago. And they are amongst my favourite objects in the world. Uh, if you were presented with this in the 16th or 17th century, you, you might refer to it as a thunderstone. Uh, ignoring the shell, these hand axes weren't known to have belonged to primitive man, but were thought to be li literally where lightning strikes the ground and would produce these flints. Uh, but if, if you look at this one with the shell beautifully in, in the middle of it and think back to what that early man or woman who first created it must have thought, they've picked this flint instead of many of the other others that we've discovered because of that shell. Now, there's no way they would have known that this shell was millions of years old and a fossil, but they must have recognised that it would form this beautifully symmetrical object. Uh, so they're accidentally the first recorded fossil collector uh, and they've created what to us is an object that is just beautifully perfect for a cabinet of curiosities. Do you think that something like this originally, it, it wouldn't have actually been used? It must have had more of a sort of decorative ceremonial function because of that shell. Is that the clue? Uh, certainly some of these axes would have been used, but... Many of the hand axes that we find around the UK probably were ceremonial, almost something traded as a currency. Uh, alas, without any uh, written records, we're never going to have any certainty on the matter. But just looking at these objects, that it would fit perfectly in the size of your hand. To, to me, there's something that really transport us back into deep time. That pleasing degree of symmetry is something that the human mind has always appreciated. And some, some scholars have even gone so far as to call these axes the first works of art ever made. But there is an extraordinary thought there, isn't it? That um, a Henry Moore, uh, despite his ubiquity in terms of his sculptures, is going to cost a hell of a lot more than um, a rare piece of meteorite that looks like a Henry Moore. Yeah. Um, and it would, it would be interesting to invent a time machine and put one of his works in the meteorite side by side and ask him to uh, appraise their relative and values and importance. I'd, I'd love to see how he'd, he'd react to, to one of these.